Nessa, welcome to the show. It is such a privilege to get to speak to you. I'm really looking forward to putting down in kind of in audio what is true and what is potentially true and what is untrue about epigenetics and we can get into that. So yeah, thank you for joining me. Really looking forward to it, Tom. Thanks so much for the invitation. I would like to start with the kind of the baseline, I think. Can we get a quick description of genetics and epigenetics and how they relate? Yeah, no worries whatsoever. So genetics, everyone tends to be very comfortable with. It's essentially your DNA code. It's a kind of script that you inherit when you're first conceived. And the genetic code, the DNA is very, very static. It really doesn't change much throughout your entire life. It remains pretty much the same if you live to 100. But on top of the genetic code, there's another layer of information called epigenetics. And it's basically small chemical modifications to DNA and some proteins that DNA hangs around with. And that epigenetic information is much more volatile, much more dynamic than genetic information, which is why you can use a stable DNA code and yet still be able to respond to lots of different environmental stimuli. So it basically, the epigenetic code that's on top of DNA, physically on top of it, acts sometimes like an on-off switch to switch certain genes on, and sometimes like a volume switch. So if a gene is switched on, it can turn it up higher or it can turn it down. So it's this kind of moderating level of information on top of the very stable DNA code. Does that help? Absolutely, it does. Um, and it helps me as well. Um, is there any chance you can pull your microphone a little bit away from your collar because it is just jostling? Oh, is on it? Um, yeah. Right, there we go. Is that better? Perfect. Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you very much. The example you give, which I think is really helpful in one of your books, is the idea of it being like a script and the a movie. Can you kind of go into that? Because I think that really it helped me a lot. Yeah, it helped me once I thought of it as well, I have to say. So, <laughs> DNA is like a script and many of your listeners actually probably you and I have been through the trauma say at school of having to do a school play something like that and um, you're given the script and the script is the same um, whenever a play is performed so if you think of something like Romeo and Juliet right there's been various movies made of Romeo and Juliet and they've all used exactly the same script the one from Shakespeare But if you look at the productions of those movies, if you look at how they look and how the characters sound, they're totally different. So that's a bit like genetics and epigenetics. So Shakespeare's original script for Romeo and Juliet, that's like our genetic code. It doesn't change. But with epigenetics, you can change what you do with that code. You can make a movie look different. You can... Um, create a very different stage production. So it's sort of like going through a script when you're in a play or in a movie and highlighting certain bits that you want to deliver in a certain way and maybe actually deciding you might skip a couple of speeches. You'll skip them in your production, but they're still always there in that original script. You're just not using them. So epigenetics is kind of the stage directions to the script of genetics. Um, Am I right in assuming that before epigenetics was kind of discovered and it was a um, it became a thing let's say um, that the idea of DNA was is completely set in stone there's no changing it um, and that's it yeah and to a large extent that's still true epigenetic modifications don't change what your DNA codes for they just change whether or not you use certain genes and how highly you use them but we used to have this real gap we used to say There's genetics and then you somehow get all these different responses from the same genes. Um, And we kind of just glossed over how that could possibly happen. Because if you take a really simple example, if you take something like insulin, which goes around in your body and regulates sugar uptake, in your own body, insulin will have very different effects, whether it binds to, say, muscle cells or brain cells. The genes that it switches on are completely different, and we never really understood why. Now we understand that epigenetics is basically priming certain genes to respond to insulin in certain ways. Um, And if you think about your body, actually, so we've got loads of athletes, hopefully listening to this podcast, you've got muscle cells, you've got the heart, muscle that's very different from skeletal muscle you've got your lungs you know all those things terribly important for good athletic performance 
why are your lungs so different from your heart muscle, which is so different from your skeletal muscle, when they all have exactly the same DNA script? You know, all of those tissues are genetically absolutely identical. The thing that differs between them is they have different epigenetic information on top of the genetic information. And that's why you've got heart that's different from lungs, that's different from skeletal muscle. So epigenetics is just this way of creating lots of different outcomes from the same genetic starting point. Okay, so the, the obvious question from there is, what affects the epigenetic expression? Ah, great. So people often ask, where does it all start? Which is A, which is B, which is C? And what you have to remember with biology is things never start and they never stop. They go around in circles. So when a, when a new, from the moment of conception, you have, when you're just one cell big instead of the 70 trillion cells that you are when you're an adult, when you're just one cell big, there's already some epigenetic information. There's all the genetic information. And then there's other like signaling molecules and proteins that are all sloshing about in that one cell. And they start kicking off a pattern of gene expression, which also kicks off a pattern of epigenetic activity, which will then influence downstream gene expression. It just goes on in these huge cycles that just connect to each other. Um, and you can tell by the fact my description is a bit vague that there are still aspects to that we don't really understand. But it's pretty clear that epigenetics influences gene expression. Gene expression then influences the next round of epigenetics. And it's all influenced by what particular genetic sequence you have at a particular gene. It's really hard to untangle all of those. Yeah, it seems like it's, um, like you said, there's no beginning and end. There's, there's no It's just this constant end. cycle. And what um, becomes apparent as soon as you start digging into this is it's not just you, although it is a lot of you. It's what's happening in utero and a bunch of other stuff. Oh, totally. I mean, we know that the first three months in the womb are incredibly important for setting particular levels of gene expression, mm. almost certainly by setting particular epigenetic modifications that then get kind of stuck on your DNA. So we know that things like maternal trans, uh, nutrition have an enormous impact on you know, the, um, the weight of the fetus when the baby's born, but also how they continue to use nutrition. So early ut in utero effects make a big difference, but then so does the environment you come out into. Do you get well nourished? Um, are you in a high stress environment? Is there lots of pollution? All of those things will tie in. But one of the things that's quite cool about epigenetics is it really frees most of us from this idea of genetic determinism. You know, we are not doomed at birth mm -hmm. to go down a particular route. There, there is wiggle room. And I think that's a really important thing to remember. I suppose the thing that I'm interested is how much wiggle room there is. Like, is because, and again, as soon as you type in epigenetics into Google, you come up with, and I'm not gonna name names or anything, but you come <laughs> up with some very hard scientific proof, which is just like, this is what we know, this is what we can prove time and time again, or what we can prove so far before being disproved. And then you have on the other side of it, which is for me personally, I don't see the benefit on it and it is completely what you think determines reality itself. Um, and yes, there's kind of metaphysical interpretations of that, but like, what is the wiggle room? I suppose is what I'm trying to ask. There's probably quite a little wiggle room. And I would base that on social and epidemiological studies more than anything else. Um, certainly more than our understanding of what's happening epigenetically. We know there's a lot of wiggle room because we know that say early interventions in childhood can make an enormous difference to an individual's outcome. You know, if a child gets good nutrition, is not in a very high stress environment, is loved, um, as they get older, if there are opportunities for education and for jobs, we know that the health outcomes are much, much better for that individual. So that to me implies there's a huge amount of wiggle room for most individuals. Sometimes you'll be born with a defect in your genetic script that means certain avenues are cut off for you. you. You will develop a devastating disorder, for example. But for the majority of people who don't have one overwhelming problem in their genetics, we've got quite a lot of wiggle room. Um, yeah. And I would just, I literally, I just base that on the epidemiological evidence rather than on saying, here's exactly what's happening epigenetically. Yeah. Is that kind of comparable to the idea of once you hit 25 and your prefrontal cortex is pretty much 
where it's going to be. Your personality is somewhat stable, but there's kind of a band that you can operate in. Yeah, I mean, we all know that we've all met people who were complete jerks at 25, but actually seem to be very civil by the time they're 45, because they've kind of mellowed and they've learned from experience. Um, it's certainly true that up until about 25, the brain is very plastic. It's one of the reasons why mind altering drugs may not be the best idea in early life, because they do seem to mess up what's happening as the neurons are still developing their connections. So epigenetics plays a role in all of this. It's you know, certain gene expression patterns do seem to get set easier in early life than they are in later in life. But it's very hard to say there's a point at which you have to kind of write people off that if they're a jerk at 25, they're going to be a jerk forever kind of thing. Okay, so like, is I'm trying to summarize and, and kind of get this into my own head. Is it this, um, is the idea of it's kind of solidifying, but it's not ever solid? It, yeah, that's really a good way of putting it. Um, certainly in terms of the epigenetic system, um, it's epigenetic modifications get more and more established, but they can still always have the potential to shift, most of them, um, because it is actually a system that has evolved in order to respond to changing environments. Um, there are certain things that don't change. So for example, the fact that you have muscle cells and you have lung cells, at no point, no matter how old you get, are your lung cells going to change into being muscle cells or your muscle cells going to change into being lung cells. They will stay as that cell type for your Why entire that? life. That is because early in development, when different tissues are developing, you get particularly strong patterns of epigenetic modifications that switch off certain genes. So if you think of your brain, your brain never needs to express hemoglobin, the pigment that carries oxygen around in your blood. So during the development of the brain, certain genes in the brain cells get epigenetically modified very, very heavily, like the ones that contain hemoglobin. And it actually compacts the entire region of DNA. So the hemoglobin gene can never be switched on. And one of the things that's important to remember about epigenetics is that those epigenetic modifications get passed on from cell to cell. So they get transmitted just like genetic, genetic information does. So um, you know, that's why brain cells are a terrible example, actually, because brain cells don't divide beyond a certain point. But if you look at, say, the cells that form the lining of the lungs, when they divide, they pass on genetic information to the daughter cells and also epigenetic information to the daughter cells. So the daughter cells only ever act as the same cell type. Okay. Makes Is that sense. making sense? Yeah, absolutely. There's, um, I suppose, one of the things that I keep on coming up in terms of researching this and whilst reading your book um, is that there's very kind of tangible things that affect epigenetics. So um, the chemicals you're exposed to, and then there's, I suppose, softer things, yeah. um, but on a, on a biological level, I'm sure it all transposes down to a, a chemical transmission. Um, but there's things like, okay, being the nutrition you take on board, what's yeah. involved in that, um, fertilizers my right there's that that kind of and again i i may just be talking crap here i don't know what like I, <laughs> i'm asking you for a reason and then there's like things like love care affection um that seem to affect things as well yeah it's there are there's two real difficulties with epigenetics one is that it's such a lovely field of science that it has the potential to explain almost anything about biology so sometimes when i'm talking to schools um, the kids will come up with extraordinary questions and say, could that be epigenetic? And I say, yes, it could. I could, I could create an epigenetic theory for you about almost everything to do with human life, but it doesn't mean it would be right. And it doesn't even mean it would be testable. It's a very seductive field of science because you can almost explain anything. There's an old joke in the field. Um, we have a very low bar incidentally in terms of science in terms of what we find funny but it's basically just somebody being told as they go on to give a speech at a scientific conference don't panic if anyone asks you anything you don't know just say it's epigenetics <laughs> and that's the problem you can explain mm. almost anything with epigenetics the other problem is what 
tends to happen a lot is that people find good experimental evidence for a particular epigenetic effect in a species like a mouse and then assume that it can translate really, really easily to humans. Now, there's pretty good reason for thinking it could translate because humans and mice are actually very, very similar. But you have to remember things like mice are typically very inbred, the ones we use in experiments. They have a very simple environment. They're very short lived. That's very different from humans. But I would say it is pretty clear that things like good nutrition, et cetera, do have a major impact on our biology. We know that anyway. Mm -hmm. And that some of that is through epigenetics. Um, so it, it's definitely important where it becomes very, very flaky is where you start seeing people making claims for individual supplements or foodstuffs for epigenetics. Like if I have to listen to one more person tell me that the secret to long life is red wine because of the effect it has on an epigenetic enzyme, I am going to have to take a bottle of red wine and do something really unpleasant with it to them because it's just, it's wishful thinking. So yeah, it's, it's a field that I think is interesting, but you have to keep some common sense about you. Is there any truth to the idea that thoughts are affecting us epigenetically? Right. Um, thoughts, that's a really interesting one. So, and it ties in, of course, to all the stuff about, say, the power of positive thinking mm -hmm. or the power of prayer or anything like that. One of the things that's really difficult about that is how do you even define a thought? And if you could define a thought, how do you measure it? scientifically. So I'm very much a, um, I'm very, I'm very biological. I don't believe in the concept of a soul. I don't believe in anything that exists outside the organism. You know, so to me, for example, personality or psyche, they're all part of what's going on in your brain. And your brain is about a kilo and a half, two and a half, you know, two kilos of matter. Um, and everything is kind of in there as far as I'm concerned. So when we generate what we call thoughts, there must be something happening in the brain. There's got to be pathways firing, et cetera. And the more particular pathways fire, the more particular pathways get reinforced. Again, we know that from various types of neurological work. And it is quite possible that epigenetics plays a role in that that it's reinforcing certain gene expression pathways. You'd have to be very careful about claiming that's the only thing happening because lots of other stuff happens in our brain like neurons make and lose connections and so on. Mm. Um, so yes, there probably is a component to it, but I don't think it means that you can think yourself into a particular epigenetic state. Mm. That would be extremely difficult to claim. Same with visualization, same with emotions, that sort of thing. Absolutely. I mean, if they work, they work, and that's mm -hmm. great. Demonstrating that they work through epigenetic routes would be phenomenally difficult to do. Okay. Really because difficult. there's the kind of one of, I suppose, one of the most studied things in sports psychology is visualization. Yeah. And that they, there are a plethora of examples where there's been significant changes, but it's like, what's the mechanism behind it, I suppose? Absolutely. And I think that mechanism will be extraordinarily difficult for anyone to unravel because you can't do experiments in humans of the type you would need to do. And um, you can't do them in mice. How do you get a mouse to legally, visualize something? Anyway, yeah. Well, not legally. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and the visualization thing is really interesting because if you, um, one of the things I find quite fascinating is that in the field of, say, exams, where they've done large controlled trials and encourage people to visualize being successful in their exams and to visualize what it will feel like when they pass the exams. The cohort where they do all the visualization tend to score more badly than the Watch cohort the where they don't. Apparently, they say what it is, is that people get really hooked into the vision and stop doing the work mm. because they're so convinced it's going to happen because they've visualized it so vividly that they actually don't use the kind of fear or the motivation mm. to keep working for it, which I find fascinating. Are you aware of um, Dr. Huberman? No, tell Over me about Dr. Huberman. Okay. Um, so he is basically condensing a lot of um, literature 
And mm -hmm. one of the things that he's come up in terms of visualization is initially to get that drive, it's a good idea to visualize success, to kind uh -huh. of think about like where I'm going, what's the dream scenario for me, yeah. um, how do I want that to look and feel. But once you kind of surpass that initial, I'm doing the work, like, or I'm excited yeah. about it, that's the time to do kind of, I suppose, more stoic exercises, things like what could go wrong, like how, if I don't succeed here, and the, the analogy that comes to mind is like the carrot and the stick, both yes. have their benefit. And it's like, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, now that makes a lot of sense to me. And I guess there also comes a point when visualization is also a way of planning. If yeah. the following, you know, how will I be able to overtake them on the last bend? And if so, when do I start that sprint, and etc. Skill enhancement and development. And that's absolutely. Things. How much can epigenetics be transmitted across gener uh, generations? Oh, that's everyone's favourite. Everyone loves mm -hmm. the idea of this, um, which is the idea that if, say, I don't know, Tom, if you exercise really, really well and you become really good at athletics or so whatever is your sport of choice, that somehow you will pass that on if you decide to have kids. It's a wonderfully seductive theory. In certain circumstances, in animals, um, ranging from tiny worms up to certainly to mice and possibly rats, you can show that you get transfer of information from offspring, uh, sorry, from parent to offspring. Um, so for example, it can be if you, um, there are some great examples. So if the nutrition of a male mouse is really manipulated, they tend to have offspring who have odd responses to nutrition. They might be more prone to obesity or to diabetic type conditions. On the other hand, if you give rats, male rats, cocaine, their offspring are less likely to get addicted to cocaine. Mm. Um, there's, there's a thought, hey, spending your life addicting yeah. rats to cocaine. <laughs> um, the problem, again, becomes extrapolating that to humans. There is a very, very famous scenario called the Dutch hunger winter, which was during the Second World War. There was a period where the Netherlands, everyone there, their calorific intake for a very short period of about three or four months dropped to about 600 calories a day. And this was a very precise drop. It happened over a certain period with the population who had been very well nourished until then and was very well nourished afterwards. And it also happened that it happened to pretty much everybody and there were really good health records. And with the Dutch hunger winter, it has been shown that the offspring of women who were pregnant during that period, their responses to food and nutrition in terms of their propensity to diabetes and to obesity are different from the population as a whole. That's about the only good evidence we really have of this happening in humans. It's not to say that humans can't pass on mm. effects to their offspring. It's that most of the time we would never know at an individual level. And it's because, again, humans are very outbred. We're, um, we all have extraordinarily different environments. And normally in the animal models, what you do is you keep them in incredibly restricted environments. And then you give them one huge overwhelming stimulus and see mm. if that affects the next generation. That's not what happens for most people. And so we can't ever be certain it's happening in people. Um, also, it may not be happening by directly transmitting the epigenetic information. So it might not be that we directly send the epigenetic code onto our offspring. It might be something else that's being transmitted at a cellular level, and then that reestablishes the similar epigenetic code. Um, but it's incredibly difficult to demonstrate in humans, um, unless mm. we see another situation like the Dutch hunger winter, and let's hope we don't. Yeah. It will be really, really hard. There are studies on things like Holocaust survivors and their children, but I really don't think that scientifically those hold up to scrutiny in terms of this being an epigenetic effect. Because? Because what you would have to take into account is that if say somebody has lived through something as horrific as the Holocaust, the likelihood is that has changed their emotional state, that that emotional mm -hmm. state will then influence the way they bring up their children. It will influence all of those kind of psychological yeah. factors in the home. And so the fact that their children might show different stress levels from the general population 
might just be because perhaps their home life was a bit more stressy because their mm. parents have been through something really, really horrific. So it's incredibly difficult to establish this in humans and most of the claims cannot be substantiated. Um, yeah. And it's, people find this really disappointing, especially in psychological terms. So I end up talking to say psychotherapists about this a lot. Mm -hmm. And they find the concept of epigenetic transmission of trauma really appealing because they see so many clients. It's with that kind of Jungian model. Yeah. It does. And it fits with the idea of somebody coming and saying to them, I don't know why I'm yeah. so unhappy because everything about my life has been pretty good. Mm. And then if you probe and you find out that their parents have been through trauma or their grandparents, it becomes this, ah, okay, I've inherited it. It's very unlikely that that is actually the case. Okay. So human life is essentially so messy, so varied, so distinct from a lab environment that totally. it's very difficult to, to totally. isolate single yeah. factors. And I actually yeah. rather love that because it means for each of us, probably the most important things that are happening to us are happening to us in our own lifetimes. We're not doomed by, I don't know, granddad having eaten a donut. You know, it's, it's the decisions we make that are the ones that influence us most, not the decisions that our parents or our grandparents made. And I find that rather comforting. I'd much rather be in that situation. That's the quote for the show. That was, <laughs> that was beautiful. Love it. Um, it, it speaks to me of the example of Rat Park that Johan Hari talks about in his books uh -huh. um, around addiction, the idea that essentially you can't um, use the example of or really study the effects of addiction on rats that are just kept in a one cage yeah. with one rat without any kind of enjoyable rat factors like socializing like play like sex like food like va variation absolutely absolutely because, um yeah. it's fascinating that you can change the outcome of some experiments in mice for example by giving them what's called an enriched environment and an enriched environment is simply putting a toilet roll holder <laughs> in their cage because then they've got something to run through and chew and hide in and it can change the outcome of an experiment, which is quite extraordinary. So yeah, I, I think animal models, they're really good for probing molecular pathways. They're really good for developing hypotheses, but going from that to humans, I think is a really, really big leap. And also I think ties into a very dangerous and I think fallacious desire amongst people and particularly amongst a lot of my scientific community of let's science our way to a solution when often it's not really the science that you need it's proper social interventions it's um less divided societies it's things like that you know it's decent housing you don't need to science your way out of that you need to have social interventions why did you first start writing about epigenetics um i'd so I was originally an academic, then I moved to industry to do drug discovery. And I ended up in a company that was doing epigenetics as a drug discovery mechanism. And then I moved to another com company that was also working in epigenetics, but where my job was to work with some of the best epigenetic scientists in the world at that point, and to help them work out if there were, say, new opportunities for treating cancer, et cetera, from their work. And I spent about two years thinking, God, epigenetics is such a great field and nobody knows about it. And someone should write a book about it. And then eventually thinking, oh, oh, the someone could be me. I could do it. I'm a bit slow on the uptake sometimes. Um, and so I just thought, I'm going to try it. I'm going to write a book. And I have to say, I've been delighted. I mean, it's 11 years old now, but it's... Um, it still seems to resonate with people and six formers in particular love it. Um, I've been harangued by so many admissions tutors at universities saying if I have one more six former coming and saying, well, I read the epigenetics revolution and so forth. And I just thought it was a really cool area of science that I wanted to share. And yeah, so and I've always wanted to write a book. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, as I say, there must be something that like personally attracts you to it. Like something there's there's that resonance that we get with certain ideas. There is. It's and for me, part of it is that I spent an awful lot of my time when I was learning biology um, and working as an academic researcher and so on. And I was very much genetics and molecular biology. And I'd be talking to somebody who was, say, a signaling scientist. They'd work out how cells signal to each other, and I would say. I don't get it. Why, you know, why does insulin have different effects on 
different cells from the same person and they've got the same genetics. And people would give me explanations and I would still think I don't get it. And then I realized after quite a long time, because again, I was slow on the uptake, that they weren't giving me explanations. They were giving me descriptions and that actually they didn't know why either. And epigenetics fills in that gap. It's like the link between nature and nurture. It's how genes talk to the environment. And so for me, that was a real kind of light bulb moment of, of course, this is the bit I've been missing up until now. And what excites you about epigenetics going forwards? It seems like something, like we've said, like the possibilities are huge or tiny. Like it, I can't absolutely. quite dis discover which that is. Um, what I absolutely love about it is that loads of stuff that didn't make sense. Epigenetics at least gives us a framework for developing sensible hypotheses and trying to test them. Um, and also I like it because it's just weird. It just mm. throws up new stuff all the time, new ways of thinking about how humans develop and what's happening in our bodies. So I like it from a very geeky point of view, just that it's interesting. But I also like it from the point of view of it is a good way into new drug discovery. So there are drugs now treating patients with certain types of cancer, that these drugs work by interfering with processes that have gone wrong in the cancer that are epigenetic processes. And we're starting to see those sorts of programs now moving out into other kind of diseases, not just cancer. And I think that's incredibly exciting because I really yeah. like that kind of science, really. Yeah, it's applicable to the real world problems people have. Yeah, like it's, exactly. It's genuinely helping people. Absolutely. And there's, it's, yeah, I've done lots of stuff in my career, but knowing that there's a drug out there treating cancer and I played a little part in that, you know, only a little part because it mm -hmm. takes an awful lot to get a drug to the clinic. But knowing that I played a part in that, that's a really cool feeling. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's probably the thing I'm proudest of. I like that. Yeah, I bet. I bet. <laughs> um, why should they, I suppose, <laughs> should they is the first thing. And the secondly, why should uh, someone learn more about epigenetics? because it opens your eyes to a completely new way of thinking about biology, about humans, about the rest of the animal kingdom. It opens your eyes to the idea that we are not doomed. We are not predestined to go down any particular pathways. It gives you hope, I think. Um, and it makes you, it makes you aware, more aware of what you're doing to your body and the fact that things you put into your body have consequences. Um, and also then it just throws up loads of funky stuff. So um, if you think about, say, colonies of honeybees, the queen and the workers are no different genetically. You can't tell the queen from a worker um, genetically. It's epigenetics that's creating completely different organisms. So it gives you a new way of looking at biology. Um, in some parts of the world now, because of global warming, female turtles are outnumbering male turtles by 50 to 1 because turtle sex is not dependent genetically. You know, you're going to be XY because chrome mm -hmm. genetically, I've got two X chromosomes. Turtles, their sex isn't determined by chromosomes. It's determined by the temperature at which the eggs hatch, and that's epigenetic. And so we're suddenly seeing things like this weird intersection between climate change and epigenetics completely wrecking turtle populations i mean come on how cool is that tragic but cool yeah yeah i think you used um, an example about um, identical twins as well and difference yeah. in yeah. absolutely can you tell, tell us about that so if you look at identical twins if one twin has schizophrenia for example the other twin has a one in two chance of having schizophrenia that's much higher than if they're non-identical twins when it's about a one in six correlation and the fact that it's much higher for identical twins than non-identical twins suggests there's a big genetic component to schizophrenia. But on the other hand, I've always thought the more interesting question is why isn't it 100%? Yeah. Why isn't schizophrenia absolutely 100%? And again, that comes back to that wiggle room, that somebody may be genetically more likely to develop schizophrenia. That's what essentially what the identical twin data show us. But it doesn't mean that they will. Other things have to happen. And when they happen, it's probably epigenetics, which is playing a major role in whether or not the second twin develops schizophrenia or indeed the first one did. Um, and that's, again, it's gonna be really difficult to unravel because you've got an incredibly complex biological system with the kilo and a half of the most complicated matter in the universe, which is the human brain, but it's still pretty extraordinary. 
Is it um, Waddington's landscape that you talk about and this idea that you, like, I'll, I'll let you explain it because you're going to explain it a hell of a lot better than I am. <laughs> um, but yeah, that for me, it really kind of, it gave me a visual that I could kind of follow along with and understand the difference. So Waddington was one of the last great polymaths in science. He Can could I work... ask you to pull your, uh, oh, sorry. your microphone again? Yeah, thanks. How's that? Is that all right? Perfect. Um, so Waddington was one of the great polymaths. He was one of those annoying people who could do almost anything and work in almost any field. And he was trying to visualize how in development of an organism such as the human, how you can start from one cell where the egg and the sperm fuse and you end up with 70 trillion cells, that bit's easy. You know, that's just lots and lots of rounds of division. But how is it that you end up with 70 trillion cells and they're not all the same? And so he visualized it as you start with a marble at the top of a very, very bumpy slope or bumpy hill with lots that has lots of channels and troughs and little peaks in it. And you push the marble and it, as it goes down the hill, it will fall into a particular trough and that will mean it will go into another trough and it mm -hmm. completely starts determining where it ends up at the bottom of the hill. And he said, that's what's happening in development is that we've got cells at the top. You know, we start with a single cell and it divides. So you have to visualize the marble dividing over and over again, but just tiny fluctuations in the way that those marbles start rolling down the hill means they'll end up in completely different troughs at the bottom they'll end up in completely different positions. And they, once they reach the bottom of the hill and they stop, they're not suddenly going to move from one position to another. They're kind of stuck where they were. And Waddington suggested that is what is happening when one cell divides and divides and starts becoming, the daughter cells start becoming more specialized. So the more specialized they become, the more specialized they're going to be as they keep dividing. And it's just this thing of going down all these different bumps in the hill. And it turned out to be a really valuable model for what's happening during development. And what seems to be happening is each time those cells roll a bit further down that hill, they get particular epigenetic modifications on particular genes, and that pushes them down yet another little bump and trough in the hill. And by the time they get to the bottom of the hill, the cells in your brain have a completely different set of epigenetic modifications from the ones in your liver, from the ones in your kidney, and they can never roll out of those little troughs they've ended up in at the bottom of the hill. They're never just going to become one another. And it turned out to be an incredibly useful model for understanding what's happening during development, because it is incredible what happens. And then... But there's the idea that we can kind of reset or we can move yeah. things back up. Yeah. So up in, in 2006, a scientist in Japan called Shinya Yamanaka did this amazing set of experiments where essentially, if we continue with that analogy, he took cells that were right at the bottom of the hill and he just introduced four genes. He overexpressed four genes that are really important in early development of mammalian cells. And to absolutely everyone's astonishment, it was as if those cells had gone from the bottom of the hill right the way back up to the top again. They became just like the single cell that's fused from the egg and the sperm. So they went right the way back up the hill. And then if you released them, it was like they would roll back down the hill and they could become any cell type that you wanted, depending on the little nudges you gave them in cell culture. <clears throat> and it was extraordinary because it was much easier than anyone had expected. It was extraordinary because it's opened up this entire new industry where people are trying to reprogram cells for all sorts of reasons. And it also demonstrated once and for all that when cells divide and become specialized, they don't do anything strange to their DNA. They just switch it on and off in different ways, but they don't get rid of any of it. They don't rearrange any of it. It's all still there. It's that perfect shape script is still there. Mm -hmm. What are the downstream ramifications of, of that in particular? It's opening up new methods in, for example, ways of treating diseases. So um, you can do things like um, if a person has a, neuro has a degenerative disease, the idea is that you could take out some of their normal cells, like their skin cells, for example, use what are called the Yamanaka factors, these four genes, and 
convert those skin cells back into being cells that can be anything. And then in the lab, you can change them into muscle cells and re-inject them into the person. That is the theory. It hasn't got there yet, but that is the theory. Or we could make any sort of blood cell that we wanted, you know, of any blood type, so we'd never need blood donors again. That would be, that would change everything, wouldn't it? Mm. It would absolutely change everything. You, you'd never theoretically have a shortage of blood types again. Theoretically, it can have major effects on aging. That's another area where there's lots of interest in this field. Yeah. So it's just that idea of just being able to reboot the cells in your body. But you have to be very careful because there's a huge risk when you do that, that you actually might turn the cells into cancerous cells. Yeah. Not so good. That's pretty big risk. <laughs> yeah, fairly big risk. Yeah, one, one we prefer to avoid. Yeah. What are the things that interest you in the kind of the intersection between epigenetics and psychology? I think what interests me is that it starts firming up the physical basis to psychology. It starts bridging that divide between the idea of the psyche that's almost like something completely separate, as if it has no physical basis, and actually saying, okay, there probably is a physical basis to all of this, because in my head, there sort of has to be. Um, but I do think we have to be very, very careful about this in that just because something has a physical basis doesn't necessarily mean we'll ever be able really to unravel what it is. Um, because again, because our brains are so complicated. I mean, there's billions of cells forming trillions of connections. And some of those will have happened randomly because it's, because one thing you have to be really careful of in biology is this idea that everything happens for a reason. It probably doesn't. There's loads of random stuff that just mm. happens. If you've got systems as dynamic as epigenetics or as the way brain cells can form connections with each other, when a system's that dynamic, sometimes it's just going to do stuff for no particular reason or no reason we can ever define. So I think we will see epigenetics and our understanding of epigenetic pathways starting to lead to new ways of thinking about certain mental health disorders. And it may even lead us to new ways of thinking about ways to treat those mental health disorders. What I don't think it will do is ever allow us to understand why humans are so extraordinary and so complicated. Mm. Um, I don't think we're... I think we are machines in the sense that any biological organism is a machine, but I don't think it's necessarily a machine that we'd ever be able to program fully. Yeah. What can we do or how can we use um, the increasing knowledge of epigenetics to benefit us personally? Are there ways that we can do that? Um, yes and no. Um, I, I'm slightly old fashioned on this and um Often people are quite disappointed when they ask me about this because they want me to tell them something extraordinary that will make their epigenetics as fabulous as possible, and then they'll be super healthy. Um, and there are two things to bear in mind there. One is that we have no idea what super fabulous epigenetics would look like. You know, epigenetics is constantly changing. The epigenetic modifications in our body, some of them are changing all the time. They're changing as you and I record this call. Mm -hmm. So it's not that there's one static, perfect state of epigenetic nirvana that we can aim for. Mm -hmm. The other thing to remember, I think, is that on the whole, epigenetics is starting to give us good explanations for why certain things work. But they don't alter the fact that those things work, by which I mean we might start to unravel more about why it's a good idea to eat healthily and why we should do exercise. Yeah, we might start understanding some of the epigenetic changes that are prompted by that and how those relate to healthy life. But it won't provide us with a ma magic bullet. Basically, the health advice won't change. You know, eat lots of fruit and vegetables. Don't smoke. Don't drink to excess. Go for a run. You know, it's none of the basic health advice is going to change because we know epidemiologically that that works. So it starts giving us mechanisms, but I'm not sure it's ever going to create the secret epigenetic pill that will give us all 50, 60, 70 years of perfect health. It doesn't seem very likely to me. Is there anything that you think is really important that we haven't touched on yet? No, except say that don't sweat it too much about epigenetics. It's really important as a biological system, but you can't actually do anything specific. You can't say, I want to epigenetically modify the following gene 
in the following cells in my brain. You can't direct it like that. Um, and I think particularly for women who are mothers or who are pregnant or, or who are thinking about becoming pregnant, don't use this as another stick with which to beat yourself in terms of was I a good mother? Have I damaged my offspring epigenetically? You know, just think of it as it's part of the background information to what we know as good health messages anyway. And whenever you see a strange claim or a huge claim being made for epigenetics, I would say always just take a step back and go, really? How would that actually work? And do you really have data that support that? Or is this all just hand wavy stuff because epigenetics is the new kind of thing that everybody's talking about? You know, I have seen shops with selling you ridiculous products with huge epigenetic claims made on them. It's all just bunkum. That's just snake oil. So, yeah, yeah just take a step back. Yeah. Like, again, there's, there's this really kind of what I found googling despite well actually your book was a, a good filter for Excellent. what is like okay what should i trust and not trust but there's this kind of like there's this intersection and on one extreme it's very easy to see this is clearly yeah. snake oil yeah. um and then there's kind of like this middle ground where it seems like there's there could be the possibility for it um and i found that was the trickiest part to navigate that is the trickier part to navigate. And I would always look at that sort of work and say, hmm, interesting, does it make any difference? You know, would it change the health message? You know, the health message is never going to become, we've done some epigenetic studies and we think we should eat less fruit and all start smoking. <laughs> you know, we, know the real, we know the real basics of good health. Everything else is just tweaking, to be perfectly mm. honest. So I would just look at those sorts of epigenetic claims and go, first of all, does that look sensible and robust? And secondly, I would apply the so what test. Mm. Does it actually drive any differences? And any supplements that claim to be specifically targeting epigenetic systems, etc., just go, oh, okay, a bit more vitamin, you know, a few more vitamins might not do me any harm, but it's very unlikely that actually I'm going, I need to supercharge my epigenetic system. It's going on perfectly fine without you. Yeah, I was going to 20x my zinc in uh, consumption, oh, yeah. but <laughs> after that, then Good. I, just, I shall take shares in zinc. <laughs> yeah, <Excellent>. okay, great. <laughs> um, I'd like to wrap things up with three questions that I always ask everyone. Okay. Um, first one is, what books have you gifted most? Oh, what books have I given away most? Yeah, or gifted to other people, yeah. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, do you know, I think it's probably the book Fermat's Last Theorem by okay. Simon Can you tell me more about that? Right, Fermat's Last the Theorem is fantastic. It's about in, um, oh God, I can't remember when, about 17th, 18th century, um, a mathematician called Fermat. He wrote in his notebook this very, very simple formula um, and said, I have a very elegant proof for this, but I have no room to write it in these pages. And it's driven mathematicians insane for about 200 years, trying to work out if Fermat if there was a proof for this. And eventually, about 20 years ago, somebody did generate a proof, which couldn't possibly have been anything firmer generated because actually most of those mathematical techniques weren't around when he was alive. But the reason it's such a great book is that you can be utterly useless at mathematics. And I guarantee for the first 90% of the book, you'll still get it anyway. Um, you'll, the mathematics is so beautifully described. So I have... Um, yeah, I have foisted that book on so many people and not one of them has ever cursed me for doing it. It's a great book. Nice. Sounds like a maths version of uh, Feynman's Six Easy Pieces. Or yeah, seven, pretty much. And it, it's got loads of brilliant history in it as well. It's, it's very elegantly written. So yeah, that's a great book. What habits do you perform for your own mental health or performance or just general well-being? Um, getting outside. For me, being outside is super, super important, um, whether I'm geeking out looking at insects or something or just digging or whatever, um, just being outside, massively important to me. Perfect. And then finally, where can people find you? Where can people uh, find your books? 
Yep, so they can find my books in all good booksellers and quite a few bad ones as well. Um, also, they're all still available online. I have a website which is nessacary.co.uk and I'm an occasional shouty voice on Twitter as well as Nessa Carey. Um, so um, often nothing to do with epigenetics, just everything else that's really annoying me or really making me enthusiastic at the time. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nessa. Really appreciate your time. Lovely to talk to you, Tom. Okay, Thank see you, you again.